into this computer. All right. All right, here we are. I uh, am the facilitator convener of this group gathered before you. Um, I'm Terry Rankin. Uh, I think of myself as an itinerant semiotician. There's a mouthful of syllables that confuses everybody. Basically, it's a roaming around discerner of signs about truth, about reality. That's more or less a philosopher. <laughs> so I think of myself as a journeyman philosopher with theoretical and applied cognitive science, like cognitive science and technology, a zealous conversationalist and a collapse adaptation guide. That's about enough of a thumbnail for me. And I'm honored to be in the company of Roger Hallam, founder, founder of Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil, Beyond Politics, lots of other activist groups. Been at it for going on a quarter century, I think. Leader this is all my portrait work, by the way. Yeah, I did. I got yours here. I couldn't get Glenn because you hadn't done him. I know. He's the only one. Yeah, but I've got you up there, and there was mine. Glenn, I put one in for you, uh, but I want you to follow up with your own take because I never quite get you right when I try to describe who you are. You're such a complicated fellow. But I have you down as, as um, just a second here. I have you down as an environmental philosopher with theoretical and applied interests in relationships between ecosystems and human health and well being. Your 2019 book, Earth Emotions, New Words for a New World, introduces everyone to a new vocabulary for describing the full range of those emotional responses and the emergent state of the world. And this is where symbiocene comes into play. Uh, solastalgia, of course, is a clinical term that you invented. And it's now in the United States medical world and the UK medical world. It's a clinical diagnosis. And uh, fish, uh, what did I say about you? Let me see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a piece you? of paper out. Sorry, <laughs> You've got a piece of paper on each of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I couldn't get your folder from the CIA, but I'm sure there is. One. <laughs> uh, I think, Fish, I have you down, or Dwayne Booth uh, uh, here in the U.S. with me is uh, also known as Mr. Fish. Anyone who knows him knows that. Political cartoonist from the deep end and freelance writer, many of the nation's most reputable magazines, journals, and newspapers, recent books, Go Fish, How to Win Contempt and Influence People, <laughs> Warning, Graphic Content, and Then the World Blew Up, uh, Long Story Short, uh, Turning Famous Books into Cartoons, and more in the progress, I'm sure. Indeed. So, and just so everyone knows, Fish, I've been stealing Fish's work for at least five years, <laughs> copy and pasting it into my own stuff. So each of you, you can see, Fish, you're the revolutionary artist, visual, iconic artist. Glenn, you're the revolutionary mm, scientific geologist, if you will, or yeah, geological time anyway. And Roger, man, to the core of your being, you're a revolutionary power to be reckoned with as far as the shit storm we brought upon ourselves. So having said that, let me kick us into a conversation here, if I can get going. I'm gonna share a slideshow and I've entitled this gathering and conversation to be a revolution rationale. I had it down as a revolution apologetics but there's a preponderance of religiosity to that apologetics term and I don't wanna push that into the conversation. It can come in, I have no problem with it, obviously, but um, I didn't want to load it up with that. So I changed it to revolution rationale. Uh, I took a quote, Roger, from the interview you did last April with Aaron Bastani. I think I got that right on his show Downstream, where you said, and I quote, normally people are primarily interested in meaning People want to be loved and they want to give love. And if they cannot give love and they cannot receive love, then either they become self-destructive or they become externally destructive. Keep that distinction in mind. In other words, if we're going to think concretely 
about how we're going to get out of this enormous mess. We have to go back to fundamentals. We have to reinterrogate what we think human beings are and how they tick, who we are and what we do. On that basis, we can design social spaces where people will feel empowered and connected. Then they'll move into social struggle. But you have to get your ducks in a row philosophically first. So I think of this gathering of the four of us, especially the three of you, as a flocking of philosophical ducks. We're here to see if we have our philosophical ducks in a row, sort of. Glenn, this quote from you ties right into what, what Roger said in that quote. Uh, and I read from symbiosis is life, dysbiosis is death, uh, from your Psychoterratica online journal, I guess, would be a good description for what that is. Here's the quote. Warfare has been part of the human condition since recorded history. The origins of the word war have meanings connected to states of confusion and being mixed up. I can see the relevance of war at a time in history where, to end the biophysical and conceptual confusion, we need a shock to our current system. Many humans, the earth destroyers or terrathorans, are now at war with the environment they inhabit. They're also fighting earth-creating or terranation humans who they see as blocking their freedom to further exploit. Now, before I move on, Glenn, I, I know you, I left out the line here that I think you'd like to add in. Oh, it's just purely that uh, the uh, terraforans, the earth destroyers, not only fight their opposites, the uh, uh, the earth creators or terranation humans, they also fight each other. So that's... Uh, a, a glimpse of uh, of hope in the sense that uh, the the terraforans are self-destructive as well as destructive of uh, other types of uh, humans and their uh, psychosocial attitudes and uh, and beliefs right and roger that ties right into writing and, and videos that i've seen of yours where you see the crossroads we're coming to actually that we're already at is we are going to devolve and collapse and plummet into a fascist regime by the global scale, or a revolution is inevitable and justified, as you said in the quote, to bring, to avoid that other crossroads, that other alternative. So is any, anything you want to add to that before I move on? No. <laughs> <laughs> Love a simple answer. That sounds, anyway. sounds very convincing to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm always getting convinced by myself. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, that's uh, a bad admission, isn't it? But, yeah, that's, uh, kind of a, that's kind of a cross to bear that I can relate to. <laughs> I mean, people mistake, I think, mistakenly think we are really happy with our doomster view of things, right? We're really glad that we know these things. And I'm just stunned when I can tell that that's how somebody perceives it. I'd give anything not to know this. You know, not that I want to be stupid or ignorant. I'd just give anything if it weren't true and I didn't have to know it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I keep, I keep, and I almost think that I'm suffering from some kind of confirmation bias because I keep seeing stuff that just makes this doomster reality so vividly true and the inevitability. Yeah, yeah the inevitability that we just mentioned from from your work so anyway let me move on to fish and get us beyond this slideshow this is a book cover that mr fish did for chris hedges his second in a series two books to second volume of two that he wrote on war the first was war is a power that gives us meaning a force that gives us meaning this is the more recent one the greatest evil is war and I would say that that illustration pretty profoundly illustrates it, Mr. Booth. Uh, oops, I got out of my slideshow. Did I? My bad. And this is the next one by Mr. F Mr. Fish. Um, and I hope one day we can find it and get the title, Fish. <laughs> that would be nice. I'd like to have it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. This speaks for itself so vividly. And in case... It isn't recognizable to everyone. The base image, if you take away the uh, George Washington profile and, and face, you take those away, the image comes from the Vietnam era where a guy just randomly shot a prisoner in the temple with a snub-nosed 38 pistol. And Mr. Fish brought that image, resurrected it from history, 
and brought it back into the reality of our times by showing, are we killing ourselves? Or are we killing each other? Are we doing both? Is it homicide? Is it suicide? You know, I think it's a both and. And that's just brilliantly rendered, I think. So anyway, that's the slideshow. And as I say, um, I hope, let me stop the share, get it back to the four of us. My hope is that I can, we can, I can turn this over to the three of you because I've, I've used these, this introductory stage to introduce you to each other. You know a little about each other and I hope this takes you a little further. And I wanna take that book title from Chris Hedges that Fish illustrated so well as kind of a beginning premise to start with. The greatest evil is war. Because what troubles me, one of the things, many things that troubles me about being actively involved in this existential crisis, this collapse of truth and reality that we're confronting, this extinction that's rushing over us, is that we never, we talk about physics, we talk about biology, we talk about chemistry, we talk about all the sciences, but we never talk about military science. And that's kind of a euphemism for what's going on. Warmongering is a better term, I think. So I want to start the conversation or ask you to start the conversation among yourselves, especially. I'm getting tired of talking. I want to hear you guys speak to what the issues are and what it is to be a revolutionary from each of your perspectives. So starting with that idea that Fish illustrated for Hedges, can you talk to us a little bit, Fish, about how you and, and Hedges came to that cover for the book? I can. Um, I will, after I say two things, just in response Please. to the a couple things that you said. Um, first off, I would say that to label us as revolutionaries is I, is accurate from sort of an external point of view. I, I, would, I, would, I think it would be smarter to recognize that we're revolutionaries in public. I think I, because I think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to tap into what makes a human being a human being, which I think empathy is built in there, love, recognition of destruction, being a terrified of destruction, not wanting to contribute to destruction. Uh, because remember, in 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 the public, in the in, in the public uh, sphere, there's penalties for giving a shit, right? Uh, there's rewards. For not giving a shit. So I think that the, what what you know, Glenn and Roger and myself, if I can speak for us, is uh, just speaking the blunt truth of what it means to be a human being first, and asking for participation in recognizing the the multiplicity and the commonality that we all share, and the and the commitment that is really at our centers anyway, um, to try to s literally save the species. Because I think just what I know of Glenn's work and Roger's work, this is not the, the, the imperative is such that this is this we're trying to as pompous as it might sound, you know, my mission is to try to save the humanity that I'm part of. So I'm trying to save myself, but I'm also trying to save this collective that uh, needs a wake up call. All right. So I just wanted to sort of make that differentiation between just like because uh, I always get a little uncomfortable when it looks like. You know, this person is committed and actually, you know, a, a applying um, um, strategies on how to help us all. So therefore, as a public person, I don't have to step into that realm. Somebody else is doing it. I think they're very good. I can't I, I can't imagine myself having the talent or the time, you know, or the privilege in however that manifests to, in, in, you know, engage in that fight. So I'm going to be a spectator and watch the people who seem to be professionals and people who know how to do it, do it. That's not going to, you know, nothing is going to come from that. We're actually going to fail. So I think just to, to call ourselves revolutionaries in public, trying to inspire revolutionaries who we know are in private into the public space to have the bravery to join the fight. All right. So there's that piece. And the other thing that I would say is, and I wrote it down while you were talking, uh, I, I understand the, the whole idea that war is is um, is is our big is is the greatest evil, right? I understand that, but I would even challenge that because I, whenever I hear things, this is how I approach my work anyway. When I hear things like that, I'm like, well, let me rephrase that using the opposite to see if there's a greater truth there. 
And I think that there might be. Because when you said it, I wrote down that the greatest evil is actually peace. Uh, when peace is based on uh, complacency and ignoring how all of us contribute to environmental collapse, right? Because that's what I think keeps us in a in, in a state where we can be automatons, you know, and 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 sleepwalk into this inevitable absolute collapse of everything. So I get I actually get nervous, like when war and violence is in the, the in, in the mind's eye in, in the public that actually to me is just like finally you know now we have something that we can all see there's there's it, it it's it's been turned into something that is undeniable right it's times of peace when i tend to be a little bit nervous you know what is what is solidifying this peace what is this based on you know you know we've been at peace look at peace treaties around the world through history, sometimes it's because we are shipping arms to them. We are helping them in some way. How are they, you know, e exerting peace on their end? So just those two broad things, just sort of with the introduction, I just, yeah. this is how I think that is going to be a smart way to sort of go about this, because I know that both Glenn and Roger, just for the work they do, you know, it's not, these things are in one way complicated and more layered, but they're also extremely simple. And I think that's the greatest frustration as a public revolutionary is just like, this is just, this is one plus one equals two. This is not invite people in because it is, it, it is simple to give a shit and to want to have show empathy to people and have them show it back. That's elemental, you know, so long as we can keep it elemental, I think that there's hope. Okay. All right. Point well taken. If I may, Glenn, just kind of hold off just a second. Uh, Roger. I know that you're days away from facing sentencing over the Heathrow action, right? That's what you were charged with and found guilty of conspiracy around that, right? And you're this month, you're going to go before the court to be sentenced for that. So I, I'm not going to ask a question. I just wanted to get that information into the conversation so that so that you guys, Glenn and, and Dwayne, you both know that he's got a lot of skin in the game right now that we are, I guess, fortunate. Well, you've gotten death threats, Fish, right? For the work Recently. You've done. Uh, Roger, you've probably gotten death threats, right? I don't know, Glenn, what goes on with you in Australia. Has anybody given uh, you I've, I've had them from America. <laughs> <laughs> that figures. That figures. <laughs> So, hey, Roger, I'm going to turn to you. It's a famous American export, apparently. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Comments, Roger? Well, yeah. Well, thanks very much, anyway, Terry, for getting us together. And, yeah, it's it's great to be here on a Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a bit of a long day doing this and that, so it's, it's great to have a chat. And, uh, yeah, I should also say the reason I'm in bed... <laughs> It's not because I'm going, oh, I'll just get in bed and have a chat with these Americans <laughs> and Australians. But like I've I've actually pulled I broke my leg in four places last year. And so I was in bed for like three months and then I, I had the bright idea of walking down a hill and then I basically sprained my good leg and I can't like uh, get out of bed. Anyway, so uh it's not some big symbolic statement, you know, subversion that I'm in bed or something. It's just the way the way it is. Anyway, so that's get that out of the way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, when, when you're talking some, uh, so many different topics we could talk about and, you know, you're always going to sound a bit trite, aren't you? Whatever you say, <laughs> because when you know, oh, talk about revolution once, you know, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever you're going to say is going to sound a bit naff, but, um, but yes, I mean, I, uh, I have got skin in the game and what have you and i've i have done a, a lot of thinking i'm doing a lot of thinking at the moment because i've sort of gone through a bit of a a sort of rejigging of what i'm trying to do and what i'm trying to say and what what i think about what i need to do and what have you and um yeah i, I suppose i have come round to this idea of being a public revolutionary, as Dwayne was saying, and and that's a bit of a big move, actually. I, I've got a feeling like in the US, 
the notion of revolution is a little, it's a bit like France. Someone told me this a little while ago. You know, in France and the US, the revolution is sort of semi respectable because there was revolutions, right? So it's embedded in the culture somewhat, for better or worse. Well, in the UK, of course, everything's traditionally been, you know, you know, don't get enthusiastic since about 1670, right? You know, so this revolution is a bit of a foreign idea. Having said that, everything's so fucked up in the UK in, a, in its own gloriously peculiar sort of way. It's not quite America, but it's, it's certainly, it's not good. Let's put it like that. You know, like everyone's so fed up in a, you know, more than at any point in my lifetime that pe people seem to, you know, I've done a few public outings recently where I've said, I'm a revolutionary, you know, <laughs> thinking, oh God, you know, everyone's going to leave the room. But it, it, they haven't. In fact, no one's walked out, thankfully. And, and it's a bit like everyone knows what I'm saying. And I think what people think I'm saying is, is everything is so fucked, you know, that no one's enthusiastic about anything unless it's going to be a complete change. Because, not because we're romantic ideologues or anything, but because of the objectivity of the situation, that little changes in 2023 just are not going to do the business. Uh, as a sociological fact, political fact. Um, and I think there's a sort of cultural lag. It's one of the little sociological phrases I like quite a lot, which is, you know, objectively, we should be doing X, but we only do it like five years later. It's about like 2.5, isn't it? And 1.5, you know. It's like everyone should have been saying in 2015, not a chance, you know, and then they wake up in 2023 going, oh, yeah, yeah. It was never going to happen, was it? No, okay, right, all right then. But the... Um, yeah, I think I see myself enabling people to be what they already want to be, which is revolutionaries, in a fairly concretized, realist sense, not in, you know, put a post of Che Guevara up on the, you know, it's not performative anymore. It's quite real. And here in the UK, there used to be quite a liberal bunch, as you know. And then, you know, the last three years, you government's put 150 people in prison, which is quite an achievement for a liberal democracy. You know, just bang people up right, left and centre uh, for substantial amounts of time. And that, I think that's because we've actually got quite organised in the UK and we've actually put up a substantive challenge to the carbon state. And it's a sign of things to come, I think, is, is we're not going to win this without to being a substantial amount of sacrifice. And, um, you know, that's in all our histories, obviously. But, you know, as you were saying, you know, being for this period of peace, which is just repressed violence and what have you. But we are, it's, it's coming out and we need to be spiritually prepared for that so that we don't get drawn into that darkness, which is coming. And for me, that's that's a big... That's a bigger gender item, really, which is why I was saying to Aaron in that interview that we need to understand what we are here to do, which is not to replicate the violence of the oppressor, but to create something totally different. Not because we're trying to be nice, because being nice isn't a very convincing, but because it's fundamentally against who we are to continue to destroy if, if you see what i mean and that needs some working out and i'm a bit nervous about it and i know what glenn was saying in that quote was sort of you know moving towards this idea of you know we've been such shits for such a long time it's going to be i'm quite looking forward to people being a bit more humble you know oh yeah we did fuck up didn't we really badly we have fucked up really badly as a civilization as a human race and maybe you know we know from the history of Christianity, you know, Terry, you know this, right? That when people fuck up, it's actually quite good because it opens people up to some transformative change. And that's a big part of that tradition, isn't it? And, you know, so, it's you know, those are the some of the things that I'm sort of rumbling around on in my slightly scatty way. But, yeah, that's enough, isn't it? How about that, Terry? That's excellent. I mean, I just... <laughs> You, Glenn, you're going to have a hard act to follow after these two. Uh, 
But Roger, I want, when we come back around to you, I want you to talk about citizens and people's assemblies as means in that direction and the humanity project, which I think is another one you have on the table. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Okay, so Glenn, where are we in this? Yeah, that, as, as, you, as you said, it's uh, there are so many dimensions of this. That, and as a transdisciplinary thinker, sometimes I think, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on top of all this and uh, it, it's all making sense. And other times it's... It's a uh, war inside my head, a state of confusion where I'm struggling to uh, uh, to fight my way out of it. But I did declare World War Three in Earth Emotions in 2018, and so I didn't muck around with this uh, idea. Uh, obviously, the the greatest evil is war. Uh, it has a particular meaning, and uh, I, I appreciate where it stands. But I, I agree with. Uh, with fish in the sense that uh, a state of war, uh, a state of uh, confusion and conflict is where we're at at the moment. So I declared World War Three, but I made it clear that this is a war of the emotions. And that's why that distinction between the Terraforans and the Terranathian people is just a, mm -hmm. uh, a new way of, uh, of redefining or, or re-contextualizing uh, aspects of human nature, which we already know about. Uh, and so the war of the emotions I wrote uh, in a kind of optimistic light would be uh, a way of avoiding a war between nuclear missiles and drones and all of the things that we now can see unfolding in, in, in Gaza and other parts of the world. Uh, so I, I, I'm a realist with respect to the conflict, but I'm hoping that my contribution as a transdisciplinary thinker is that the uh, if we can sort out our emotional conflict, we might be able to av avoid the the worst case scenario, which is the uh, the the Chris Hedges headline. And so the uh, the the choreography of uh, Terranacea and Terrafora is all about trying to summarize uh, in a way that might. Uh, be attractive to a contemporary audience, a secular view of goodness and evil, uh, that uh, this is a way that we can explain aspects of human nature, part of our evolution uh, needing to be both uh, displaying both these uh, um, terranacient nurturing tendencies, the love, the empathy and all the rest of it, but the, the terraformans are just as much part of our uh, evolutionary history and are in, indeed important parts. And there are many other thinkers. Bill Rees comes to mind straight away as someone that says, you know, a lot of these things were adaptive as part of our uh, evolution, but now they've become maladaptive once connected to a, a, a terraforan economic order, otherwise known as capitalism. So I, I'm trying to fit a, a model of thinking into a contemporary context, make it as secular as possible, because I think that's where most people are uh, with their own uh, commitments. And to, to give, uh, in particular, young people a view of uh, our possibilities as humans, uh, uh, a vision of the future, and that, hence the, the reason for creating the the meme or the mega meme of, of the symbiocene, which is to say that that Terranacean aspect of our of our past and, and uh, relictual present is something we can build on. And so I I think, uh, and Roger will correct me if I've, I've got it wrong, that this idea that we need to change everything has to include a vision of the future, which is, uh, you know, the opposite of uh, what we now understand the Anthropocene to represent. So I'm characterizing these uh, uh, these polarities. Uh, of course, there are nuances in between the poles, so it's not uh, you know just simple X and Y and nothing else in between. I'm trying to get the the polarities uh, clearly understood so that we can start making choices, and those choices are between you know, dysbiosis and death and symbiosis in life. Uh, I think I agree that uh, the, the, the possibilities are now contracting. We're not, uh, the, the complexity is there, but 
uh, we either go in a direction where we can see some kind of <clears throat> uh, viable future or we're not going to do that and we're going to collapse and die. And that's a pretty savage and difficult uh, dichotomy to deal with. So that's that's pretty much a summary of where I think um, my my position comes from. And I, I mean, I wrote Earth Emotions in 2017 and 18 and Extinction Rebellion didn't exist at that time. Nor at, well, If it did, it was in its uh, uh, in a form that was uh, very early on and hadn't really become public. And the same with Greta Thunberg, she she was obviously at school ruminating, but hadn't uh, created school strike for climate change. I would have loved to have had those kinds of social movements that uh, Greta represents as well uh, in the book to give an illustration of this changes everything uh, and and how quickly and how deeply we must uh, uh, make these changes. So I'm writing now on a book for, on the symbiocene where I can begin to include uh, many more examples in the social and emotional domain, the cultural domain of uh, of some kind of uh, future that is more optimistic than than catastrophe and and, and Armageddon. So that uh, I'm still working through these ideas. Uh, I'll take all of this coming year to incorporate the the new thoughts and hopefully there'll be some kind of conclusion uh, uh, at the end of it all that's that's worth uh, worth reaching so i'll leave it at that yeah. glenn one of the things that i immediately i mean saw nostalgia is where i picked up on who you are and what you were working on right i will say that psychotheratica your journal blog online and by the way for those who may be happening to watch, I'll put links in the comments below this video to yep. Clown Crack and Psychotheratica and your website, Roger, so people can get more, much more of what's needed. But back to what I was saying, Glenn, one of the things that grabbed me right away about your work is I've been struggling with just how right Orwell was in the fact that the, we don't have an adequate language anymore to talk about the truth and the reality we're living in. Yep. You can't utter a single three word phrase that isn't loaded with emotional baggage in an ordinary conversation in the street or in an academic ivory tower. You bring in mm -hmm. anything, anything into conversation that is, is, is meaningful, rich with any kind of meaning, good or evil, terra thorn or terra nation. <laughs> and the terra thorn yeah. and terra nation have no baggage. <laughs> which is well, what that's, uh, right into what you were doing. Here's a language that Orwell didn't know about that gives well, us a new way to build meaning. I really love I'm, it. I'm hoping that that language building has many, or there are many reasons for doing it. One of them is that the world is changing so rapidly that our language hasn't kept up. So there's there's an obvious reason for, for building uh, language. The other one, I guess, is Wittgensteinian, that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Well, I want to blow that away with more language, challenge people with the existing language, where uh, our language is inadequate, uh, introduce new terms if necessary, examine other cultures and other languages to see what, what contribution they can make to uh, a, a more uh, expansive understanding of what's going on. So I don't do it just because I'm pissed off with existing language. I, th I think we're struggling with language to map or cover the uh, the extent and severity of changes that have taken place, particularly in the last 50 years, but over the Industrial Revolution and and, and wherever you wish to start the the period of uh, the the Great Turning, where mm. we move from being a terra nascent species to a a terraforan one. Well, it could have been 500 years ago. It may have been at the start of the agricultural revolution. I don't really know, but I think it started on the 5th of March, 1953, which was the day that I was born. So that that's how I anchor it. It's it's it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty good pretty good date to start a few things like the Anthropocene. I go back four years further, and I feel like I just fell right into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I start the book of emotions by saying I'm a child of the Anthropocene. Yeah. Well, one thing, can I just jump in with with something? Absolutely. Really great point. I think that uh, about that Glenn was making about um, 
the limitations of language and sort of what is happening now with the distraction of of social media and certain technologies that you know have turned everything into a kind of you know uh it, it, it's staccato it's short form there's no time for contemplation there's no and if you don't have time for contemplation there's no opportunity to build wisdom about anything and i think one thing that we all have to recognize is the the um destruction of the arts community over the last 50 years um, is a hugely contributing and and it's a factor that we cannot ignore because if you look at through history and you look at successes when it comes to revolutionary thinking and also moving the ball forward with um with you know ideas about democracy and participation and and the and listening to marginalized voices and and so forth and you know extending human rights and all the different places where it has succeeded uh, a, a really profound catalyst in all of those movements was the arts community. Because remember, the arts community has always been there to allow a, a reconfiguration of thinking, uh, suggesting radical new ways to consider things. You know, you could go in, like, a, a, for, for example, rather than just allow people in power to frame all the parameters of the discussion and segment people into their proper cat you know their proper categories this allows that idea that we're we're all human beings um and i've even like for example if you want to figure out what the what, what is the number one thing you can call somebody to shut down conversation and to vilify them you call them a nazi right uh the arts community is the what i see as the only community who would be capable of creating a piece of theater where they can communicate that Nazis were not monsters in the sense that they weren't human. They were human beings that became complicit with monstrous ideas, surrendered to them somehow, you know, contributed to the practice of monstrous ideas. So if you have a, a, a way to interrogate bullshit, to get to what is the through line, human beings who operate at different levels of enlightenment and different levels of ignorance. Uh, and their brains are attached to their hands. So sometimes they are going to do monstrous things, but they're also going to be able to do benign and beautiful things. Um, so I would say, Glenn, like if if you're if you're if you're going to have something where you're addressing the uh, the necessity for a language that is deeper. Um, go to the non-lingual language, which is imagery, uh, music, all of these things that we congregate around to remind ourselves that we're vulnerable and our lives are worth living. Because we all have, with, with luck and grace, we all have those, the, the, those, those, those tendencies in our lives who want to, um, to congregate with each other or even with ourselves <laughs> to remind ourselves that we're human beings. And that's what makes us precious. And that's what makes us, I think that that's what turns us into revolutionaries. Because if we can have the arts community to remind us that we are worth saving, because I think that that's what it does, uh, then we are revolutionized, you know, because then we're going to say, fuck that, you know, I am precious. I have this, 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 this vocabulary through the arts community. Um, and I'm going to, protect it. That's how I'm going to be politicized. I think the best way to politicize somebody is through other channels outside because politics can, can tend to turn people off, you know, because it moves very slow. There's so much compromise in politics and so many people, their understanding of politics is if I can get this into the right politician's inbox, have them try to figure out how to, to have, um, Empathy, apply the necessary relief to what is being proposed by what is in my inbox. <laughs> um, you know, what, how am I going to compromise to get this to move into the next inbox, to the next inbox, to the next inbox until it's so fractionalized that nothing gets done? In the 1960s, it was just like, you're not even invited to the conversation. In the United States, it was just like the Democrats and the Republicans. No, that's mom and dad. So the comics underground movement in particular was just like thumbing their nose. Fuck you, mom and dad. It's going to be up to us now. We have our own responsibility to build our own lives. Then you have the feminization of society, you have the environmental movement, you have civil rights. All of this stuff exploded, not because it was asking for permission from the people in power or the establishment. It was saying, we're going to do it without the establishment. And it got nailed to a cross for doing that. Yeah.
Right. But yeah, but there's still great, you know, what we have gotten from that movement, you know, is something we can't, we, we can't, you know, delegitimize or just say that it oh, no. certainly it doesn't feel like enough, you know, obviously, yeah. because, yeah. you know, the problems continue to expand and are now literally threatening everything, yeah. you know, but at least there is the opportunity um, for that kind of uh, vocabulary, because I think that if we just recognize it, we can, we can access it. It's already happened. Well, just just briefly, I can say um, with some pride that many of the concepts, particularly solastalgia that I've developed, have been taken up by the arts and creative communities. And so there's a much uh, wider um, coverage of my work in the arts community than there, than there is in philosophy or sociology or yeah. uh, other academic channels. So at any one time during a week, there's uh, exhibitions on somewhere in the world that are featuring solastalgia. Uh, and so I'm, I can see the point you're making very clearly. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not an artistic toenail. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm now totally reliant on these brilliant people around the world picking up on these themes and doing with them what they see fit. And most of the time, it's fantastic, creative and uh, revolutionary work that they're doing. So that's all I wanted to add was that I totally agree that that artistic uh, uh, arm or element of creativity is uh, is critical to this next phase that uh, hopefully uh, is not Armageddon, but is uh, the uh, the more creative possibility that is present to us. Yeah. Actually, Glenn, <laughs> I asked, there's a time when Fish would do a drawing a month if you were a patron of his on Patreon, and I mm -hmm. sent him Solastalgia as a word mm -hmm. to do a drawing around. Yeah, And I'm trying to find it, but my search feature, because of all the bandwidth being taken up, my search feature is not working real well. But right. I think I sent it to you. It's a bottle of the I, bottom floating. I think, yeah, yeah, I yeah. had it. I, Great. I have it. But Roger, and all three of you, I want to speak to this, but Roger, I want to start with you. But I want to interject a thought based on what both you, Glenn, and Fish have said. Philosophically, the framing of my thinking is always around Charles Sanders Peirce, the American Aristotle, as he's known in the UK by Bertrand Russell and Whitehead back in that day. But he was a semiotician and a pragmatist. And pragmatics, as we understand it, was kind of corrupted by Harvard academics from what Peirce originally thought. So pragmatically, I know the practical is, and the pragmatic is where you want to live, Roger, and I totally respect and honor that. No buts, I just want to point out from Purse, the reason that a picture is worth a thousand words, and it is, and then some, goes to exactly what Fish was talking about. Icons, icons are signs that represent things because they resemble or they have familiarity emotionally, not symbolically like language. Language is a made up system based on habits and rules and conventions. It's symbol systems, but the arts, the aesthetics, even of the written language is the iconic power that they have, the familiarity that stirs within us when we see an image. That happens instantly. The symbolic has to feed its way through the alphabet and the lexicon and the paragraph and all of that, and then maybe it'll make you feel something. I don't want to diminish books with a written word, but I much prefer comic books all the way back to when I was a kid because I had pictures with the words and you could respond to the imagery instantly, even before you had a chance to think about it, which is, which is I think, a really good thing. So what I want to go to for all three of you, maybe this will wrap us up. I'm shutting off an alarm. All three of you are working directly with the generations behind me or, or ahead of me, my millennial daughter, my Gen X stepdaughter, and my Gen whatever they are, grandchildren. But you, Fish, I know you do, you lecture at, is it Pitt, Penn State? Yeah, at Annenberg at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Annenberg, yeah. right, right, right. So you lecture to like college age kids today, maybe a few older and younger in the crowd. Roger, I know you're out there in the streets and in meetings and in sessions constantly. 
with the, the British youth, the generations younger than you and me both, right? And Glenn, I know you're out there speaking and talking and communicating with that same generation. Now, where I live in Florida, uh, in what I would call the magic kingdom, the kingdom of magical thinking, I can't get three kids together to talk about anything. The only time I get an opportunity to do that is when I go to my daughter's writing workshop. Then I'm in a room of millennials. And I've earned their trust and their confidence and uh, some of their respect. And so I can have conversations with them. But um, I, I, a university won't let me anywhere near them. <laughs> I mean, they all they do is take one look at my social media and they go, no, nope, no, nope, this guy is not allowed on campus. Um, I, the, you remember what we did with the walk with Nick, Roger, um, back in the day. Uh, anyway, all of that to say, I'd like for each of you to tell me what are you experiencing in your efforts to influence or to awaken or to inspire or to get these kind of, to untangle this Gordian knot of reality that we've tied ourselves into? What are you experiencing in those relationships, those communications with the younger generations behind, you know, ahead of us? Yeah, yeah. Well, I can say a few things. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Is it my turn? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this is all we're in. We're in very interesting times, aren't we? And they're they're about to get even more interesting, you know, in the Chinese sense. And and I think what I'm trying to communicate to people is, which is obviously a bit of an uphill struggle, is the next ten to twenty years are going to look nothing like the last thirty and potentially not the last thousand, right? It, it's all going to blow up, guys. <laughs> you know, it's maths. <laughs> it's it's going to go. And, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, and, you know, as you say, I'm pretty pragmatic. You know, I'm not saying what happened in the past is totally terrible. What's going to happen is the future. I don't, I'm just saying it's just not add up, right? The numbers don't add up. And... Um, you know, Florida is going to be evacuated. You know, it is going to happen. Da da da. You know, so so for me, like, like when when I, I was in prison for four months, dare I say it? And I thought, oh, I better read up on this revolution business because you know I've been wandering around going, hey, let's you know let's do this revolution thing. I thought I better get a bit more up with that, <laughs> up with it. So I read a few books and things, and it was really good because. You know, as a sociologist, I'm always looking for patterns. And there's all these patterns that happened in previous revolutions. So it's not like it's not like we're starting from zero here, right? You know, societies have gone through massive traumas, you know, every 30, 50 years, the last 2,000 years. It's not like we don't know what happens. And one of the fundamental things that I'm interested in and this, you know, relates to how to communicate to younger people. And also, you know, what Glenn and um, Fisher are doing, like, in terms of, we're all involved in communication, aren't we? And it's like, how does this all fit together? And there's there's various different bits that I'm sort of working. But one of the main bits is, is, is that people in the past just didn't, have so much self-pity that our culture did and this is really important you know aside from whether it's a good or bad idea it's obviously massively important for a revolutionary movement to enjoy itself right in its certainty that it doesn't give a fuck you know and i, I think was this is what you're saying fish about you know artists in revolutions they're basically they don't they don't care they are doing their thing you know and obviously that was a big thing in the late 60s and i always try and remind young people you know in 1962 was it when they had students for a democratic society and you had all these people in little thin ties you know like the early beatles and then by 1968 they're doing somersaults in front of judges right what the fuck happened in six years and they're going well we know what happened vietnam happened but something deeper happened which was a complete a complete challenge to a system of meaning that had been inherited out of the Second World War and, you know, all the rest of it, 
right? I mean, there's loads, you know, it's complicated business, but it's really interesting how society, how culture can change from a deference orientation and a self-pity vulnerability orientation to I'm just living my life, which is how I want to put it to people. I'm experimenting with different phrases, but it's like, I'm living my life, you know. If they put me in prison, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like you're sort of subliminally implying, you know, oh yeah, on Friday, you know, Rogers might go to prison and isn't that terrible? No, it's not terrible. It's like, it's it's what you do at this time in history, you know, and I genuinely don't give a fuck, you know. I mean, it's, it's difficult because I'm going to have to not, you know, do. Uh, there's loads of things I want to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I've got relationships and things, you know, and all this sort of thing. But it, in terms of the political metaphysics, as it were, it doesn't matter. And that's a big change which needs to happen. And that's what, that's one of the big things we need to communicate. You know, I've got this phrase, the joy of revolution, you know, which doesn't, doesn't avoid the horror and the despair, but comes out of the horror and despair. Because if what we're facing is so horrible and despairing, then let's just live our lives. Not Let's not have this control fetish that we can actually, things have to work. And then everyone just becomes really cautious and stressy. You see what I mean? So it's, diff it's, it, it's that's one major thing. So for me, like it doesn't, when I go in front of young people, you know, there's this, there's this thing, oh, you know, the young people, you can't tell them what to do. Um, you know, they're, 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 we're all the bad old guys. You know, I go into talk young people and I say, you don't know shit. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you some things. And you know how it works, right? You get respected because you're not bullshitting. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not telling, you know, I'm not going to the extreme of being, a, you know, sadistic or anything stupid like that. But it's like being honest and saying, I've been, you know, organising people every week for 40 years. I know a thing or two, guys, right? Here's some ideas. And obviously you can tell me to piss off. But, you know, I am doing my thing because fundamentally I am not interested in persuading them. And this is the critical thing about revolutionary like confidence is instead of going, oh, my God, revolution is going to be really difficult. You know, everything's against us. Well, you know, no disrespect. Well, this is American left defeatism. Right. It's like everyone excels at saying how bad everything is. You know, it's, it happens across the whole Western world. I'm not interested in how bad things are. What I'm interested in is how to enjoy my life. You see, I mean, that's a different thing altogether. And this this is what I read from revolutionaries in the past. And that's why they ended up not worrying about being shot and being put into prison and how they took over states is because they knew their stuff and they were coming for you, you know, and maybe they wouldn't get there or maybe they would. I mean, like, you know, what Castro going to going to Cuba. I mean, what a shit show. You know, he gets a ship. It, it's it's going to sink. And they go, fuck it, we're still doing it. I mean, what dickheads? <laughs> I mean, you've got to you've got to laugh, haven't you? You know, that they arrive on the coast of Cuba and they all get shot. And, you know, I mean, what keeps people going like that? What keeps people being is a zest for the actuality of life. You see what I mean? Not always thinking about, well, you know, let's do a cost benefit analysis of when we arrive on the coast. No, oh my God, it's not very good. Let's go and talk about it for the next 20 years and be miserable in some university in Mexico. You know, you see, you see what I'm saying? Like, this is what I want to revitalize in the younger generation. <laughs> and then the other thing I want to say, sorry, I'll, and then I'll shut up. The other thing, which is a bit different, but, you know, it applies to what Fish and Glenn are doing, is I think everything needs to come together in what I call like a close ecological relationship. So I don't want, you know, I don't want everyone in school to join my organisation, you know what I mean? And you have to leave what you're doing in that sort of Leninist old 20th century. Way. But I just totally fucked off with horizontalism and everyone's doing their own thing in their own little way and they're contributing, you know, doing a course here. And, you know, it's all like, it's just privileged, like, you know, rubbish, right? It's a serious fucking situation we face, and we need to come together in in big formations you know so you don't want chris hedges just going around doing a few talks every now and again he needs to talk within a movement right be independent within the movement and tell the movement what shit's going on if needs be right but he needs to be in that movement i'm sure you won't mind me saying this <laughs> <laughs> and you know so that's what i'm trying to 
to do, and obviously at some point it's going to coalesce, and then you know we're talking about something interesting, and and it, within that movement you've got these these different elements of speech and action and art all coming together, and it's the coming together of them that you see in revolutionary periods, you know. So it's you know we're all we're all agreed on this call, aren't we? Right, vision, music, sound, culture. This is how revolutions happen. They don't like you're saying fish. It's nothing to do with politics. Is it's when revolutions happen when politics is a dirty word. No one's interested in politics, which is of itself a massively political position, right? Because you're rejecting the whole thing. So again, it's like we just need to detach ourselves gloriously from the whole reformist space. You know, say so we're not doing that shit anymore. We're going off to enjoy ourselves and not go, oh, you know, that's really irresponsible. All these people used to say to me, well, Roger, if you do that, you'll be you'll make yourself irrelevant. Has anyone said that to you? <laughs> if you if you publish that book, you'll make yourself irrelevant. And it's like, well, you know, I'm on number 34, so I'm not doing so bad. <laughs> well, I, Roger, I will say, I, for those who might not know, I started in 2016 working on a doctorate degree. Uh, tried once back in the 80s and didn't get there, got all the core. Anyway, I won't go into the details. But anyway, in my studies, I discovered and reawakened to what I was back doing back when Rachel Carson came out with Silent Spring and Schumacher wrote Small is Beautiful and those kinds of things. That was my awakening to the ecological reality we were facing. And, and Greg Bateson, man, his steps from ecology of mind, that image on the cover of his book is still with me. And now looking at it through a 21st century lens, I went through a lot of that work again and a lot of the more recent work by leading ecologists. And that's where I found you all, three of you. December of 20, well, March of 2019, I think, Roger, is when I first caught on the Extinction Rebellion. But Fish, I want to say, I came out of those studies with a grasp of the reality of the doom trajectory that we're on and I, I asked myself the very question, Roger, so who am I to be and what am I to do? How am I to live my life in light of this? And Fish, I got to say, if I hadn't found your gallows humor <laughs> and your graveyard jests, it would have been a much harder struggle. You made it possible for me to, to laugh at myself trying to find that path. You made me look in the mirror and see that side of me that pumps 20 gallons into my Toyota Highlander and, and doesn't give it a second thought, you know? Right. You made me face that grim reaper and realize what Roger's talking about, that it doesn't matter what happens five seconds from now, it's what I'm doing right now. That exactly. Happens. Yeah. That's where the it's joy is. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, just to harken back to what I was saying about the arts community, are you, when you're experiencing art, it's one of those few kinds of communication that it, that demands that you exist in the moment that you're in. And and if you do that, then you're 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 grounded and you are in total recognition of all of these things that we've just been talking about today. And I think that um, to to Roger's point. Uh, it's funny because people, and I don't know if what your experience, Terry, was the first time you and I spoke, but there's people who have followed my work and they either are really into it because I go to very, very dark places. Uh, some people like it because I go to dark places, but if you look at my books and you look at the stuff I publish, there's a lot of dick, just dick jokes, there, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And so when people have met me, they're just like, you know, wow, I expected somebody who was just so tortured and broken in an interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then they meet me and it's just like something is my seems like it's wrong with you because i i genuinely wake up every day excited just because it's just like i i only have control over this moment that i'm in and what am i going to do with this moment that i'm in i'm going to think of a dick joke or if i'm really pissed off i'm going to draw something that is like really angry uh, you know, but I'm never really overwhelmed with either one of those things. You know, I ping pong around. We all are jer jerked around by our emotional realities, you know, by any number of, you know, for any number of reasons every single day. And I think getting back to what you were, you know, the question about uh, accessing younger people um, 
having college age students in front of me uh, and a number of activists, young people that I'm in constant contact with, um, you feel kind of invincible. You know, you're you're more willing to take chances when you're that age. You know, I think we can all harken back to when that was true. Um, and they're also very curious to learn about past successes done by, quote unquote, outlaws. You know, people who just who existed outside the system and were really, really interesting and really, really cool. That's the other, you know, we want to make revolutions as sexy as hell. You know, that's going to get people involved, you know. So you need a soundtrack, you know, you need a wardrobe, you need all of these things, you know, that make it really, really interesting and fun. Uh, and also the young people that I um, um, that I communicate with, they also recognize how bad things are. It's unavoidable, you know. So you can, it's much easier now, even in the last five years, to have a conversation about, you know, envir environmental collapse about the dangers of capitalism. This is stuff that I just in a, in front of a classroom, you could, it was always a little strange, you know, when we would try to talk about, let's expand our understanding about what violence is, you know? So then you start to say, you know, the rewards that you get for participating in, in you know, capitalism and the commodification of everything, that is a very deep, dark form of violence. Mm -hmm. I can have that conversation effortlessly now and they will participate. Same thing with what's going on with Israel and with and Gaza. This is the first time in the last few years where uh, you could have, to an extent, because I've recently gotten in trouble on campus for this because blood is in the water and on and on college campuses. Yeah, about, I saw that article. Yeah. Yeah. So go, if you go against, if you, the most minimal thing, if you even ask for a ceasefire for what's happening in Gaza, you're an anti-Semite. You know, and then there will be movements to try to get you fired and vilified and all that sort of stuff. But I think that that's just a testament to people. They're, they're scared now because that conversation is is eking into common speech much more than, than it ever has. So it's those moments of hope when I see young people who are a brave enough, they don't know to be scared to have those conversations. And they also recognize, particularly here in the States, that the people who have their reins on power, they're all old, by, by and large, old white men. Yeah. And they smell it in the air. There's going to be a massive die off. And all of a sudden there might be some, more, you know, greater access to people that they, that, that, you know, might have a greater tendency to understand the imperatives of, you know, the environment, all the other stuff that we're talking about, you know, that's the hope they have, but yeah. you know, it, it's my, it, it's, it's my job to show them people like Lenny Bruce, show them, you know, the counterculture, you know, the beat movement, things that aren't political, uh, Coltrane to me is just like these things are frontierism in the in the radical sort of way that again remind people uh, who we are, what we are, why we are worth saving, and it, it it politicizes them in that way. And then they'll just see how thin and tinny politics are, and hopefully we can build a society that that tries to integrate humanity uh, into the equation and not being led by politics. One of the few things I've come up with that. I enter in, when I'm in a conversation with millennials, especially the 30 somethings and around that age group, like my daughter. One of the things I've done a couple of times is uh, she had a birthday party, for instance, at a local park nearby a couple of years ago. And she had about 15 of her friends there. And no matter, my wife was with me and we went, and there were not any other parents, no other boomers, but there were some other of their age. And we were just kind of all talking around and I took the opportunity to point out that the simplest way to think of me is as a boomer doomster. And that kind of got their attention. And then I said, so I want to start by apologizing to you for my generation because we're the ones that fucked your future. And the shocked look on their face made it worth it but the value of taking that step was that it gained their it gave me some credibility i wouldn't go so far as say it gained their trust or that it moved them very far off center but it kind of shook the foundations of how they relate to my age group because face it i look like a maga republican <laughs> just visually i can't help that you know uh, but be that as it may Contrary to that initial impression appearance, 
to give them that statement of apology up front kind of shook their perspective of me. It's again, the iconic thing, the aesthetics not living up to the appearance, you know? And, and so anyway, that was a great help. So Glenn, when you're out there and you're interacting with these, these youngsters <laughs> compared mm -hmm. to me, and most of you fish, you're the youngster in this crowd pretty much, but I'll be as it may, how are they receiving your message or the message of what, again, I would call your revolutionary shift or your paradigm shift, I think is better. The paradigm shift that you're bringing to the table with Psychos Radica. Well, I think they, uh, I, I work with groups like Rising Tide, which are opposed to the coal industry in Australia, the whole coal chain from mining through to the export of uh, black coal mainly. Uh, I, until a couple of weeks ago, I lived in the Hunter Valley, which is the uh, main area in Australia where Black coal is mined, burnt, and exported. So rising tide have been around for a very long time, uh, well, well before Extinction Rebellion and Greta. And so uh, many of them were my students uh, while I was teaching at university. And so I've I've felt almost fatherly or grandfatherly uh, towards uh, this particularly brave bunch of uh, activists. And of course, they've they've all been in jail recently. And I used to write letters uh, arguing the point to judges that uh, the the real criminals were those that were arresting them, and that these people were uh, doing the right thing by all of us. Uh, what I've moved to, I, I still give talks to uh, Rising Tide and and the local branches of Extinction Rebellion. But I try now to address uh, generation symbiote scene, which I think takes Roger's point about the need for expanding the base, for expanding the uh, the, the movement. Uh, we can't keep uh, isolating and pretending that just by our own individual and small group efforts, this revolution, if it's the right word, is going to take place. Um, so I, I talk about Generation Symbiocene, or I, I call it Gen S. Um, Robert McFarlane wrote a great article on Generation Anthropocene, and I, I felt that I needed to to write something in in, uh, in not in opposition to what he was saying, but in, uh, presenting a different account of what the potential of the the generations are. And so Gen S is my attempt to uh, to engage the uh, different generations, whatever we call them, uh, and to argue and to help them see that there is a united cause here. Uh, I'm motivated, uh, I guess, by the fact that I am a father and a grandfather. I see the ethics of the situation of what Tim Flannery called future eating or fucking the future, whatever expression you wish to use, that, that this is something that is transgenerational, that uh, even baby boomers <clears throat> uh, understand that uh, uh, you, you're left with nothing at the end of your life, uh, and that in it, and if you're leaving a legacy of further damage and and desolation, mental and physical de desolation, that this is not a good uh, not a good death. Uh, so I'm I'm hoping that the different generations will see the point of what a, a vision of a good life is. And it's particularly relevant for the very young. Uh, you can't talk to them and give them a, uh, a you know, good hard, hard headed talk on what's going wrong and what the implications are for them. Uh, the teenagers, the school strike age, uh, they're all part of my grandchildren. And I, I think they understand really well what's going wrong. The young adults at university, and I haven't taught at university now for at least uh, well, 15 years. But when I get invited back, I, f I sense the, the urgency that they have for uh, some kind of guidance, but also we're in this together. We, ha we need to have this cross-factional uh, alignments, the, uh, the attempt to, to get a movement which has uh, some kind of uh, universality to it because uh, We've gone from tribal patch-disturbing species to a globalised one, and most of our 
our university uh, students can see that clearly, but they don't know what comes next. So generation symbiocene, the symbiocene itself as an idea, uh, my attempts to, to work at cross-generational, cross-factional, uh, anti-political in the orthodox political sense, uh, uh, feelings, directions towards which uh, we can go. So I talk about radical anticipation of a future. I don't talk about hope because hopium and all the rest of it have, have done, done the work of even destroying hope. So radical anticipation of a future that's a lot better than the one uh, that we can foresee now is, is the basis of my work. And I could do a really good job of being hugely negative and, you know, I could write the terraforum stories to terrify people and become hopefully a best-selling rich author. But I've chosen the opposite path, which is uh, zero <laughs> money, uh, a, a life of volunteering in a sense to try and present a different worldview. And of course, that's hugely, uh, uh, you, you know, you're, you're either a megalomaniac or you, your level of humility is too great. But somewhere in between those things, I feel I'm struggling with the, the task of bringing together these generations. I've given them a name, I've given them an acronym, Gen S. I mean, what more can I do? <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, I think I, I, I've just got something to say. Yeah, I think what I'm sitting here thinking is, is, you know, we've got one or two themes here, right, which is the empowerment of the younger generation. And then we've got this theme of revolution. And I quite like, you know, when we're talking about language, if you look at previous movements, either cultural or political, they basically rotate around a word or a phrase. You know, like radical anticipation of the future is great. It'd be great for that to become, you know, a, a a watch phrase. You see what I mean? For a new movement. So because at the moment we have hope and no hope, you know, and both of them are a bit shit, right? So exactly. it's like we, we need to do we need these new phrases. I'm totally into it, just as we need new visual memes and all this sort of stuff. And I think, you know, what basically what I think is revolution is this is the word. You know, like with punks, you know, punk was a word of, you know, of, of denigration, right? And then people said, I don't give a fuck, I'm going to be a punk. And then punk became cool. And, you know, same with queer and gay. It was like, oh, you're queer, you know, oh, that's terrible. Oh, no, I'm fucking queer, you know, fuck you. It's like, we're revolutionaries. And everyone's, you know, our generation for the last 30 years, revolution has been, oh, you're just a dick if you're a revolutionary, right? <laughs> you're either some weird academic or you're just some hard left sort of, obs you know, we, you know, and we say, no, no, we are revolutionaries. And there's something about the transgression of actually what revolution means is we want a totally different situation, which is the subliminal feeling of this whole zeitgeist that's emerging, you know, amongst the younger generation, and obviously right across society. And, you know, it's all getting deformed into fascism and all the rest of it, right? But leaving that aside, I think what... what I've just got this idea. I'm always thinking of practical ideas. You know, I've got a little conversation here. What What if we had an international conference called Revolution in the 21st Century, which is my little thing, catchphrase. And then you just have a whole bunch of people talking and doing workshops. But they've all got one thing in common, which is the whole thing is fucked and we need something totally different. You see what I mean? There's no reformist. There. There's no one going... So what I suggest you do is set up a nice campaign group and, you know, go and lobby your MP. There's none of that. Right. There's all the pathways of through to linguistic, artistic and political transgression and fusions between the two. So there's practical pathways, you know, oh, there's projects so people can combine together. And initially, you know what it's like, right? There's maybe a thousand people interested in this. But I'm totally optimistic about the idea it's going to be like 100 million in 10 years. You know, and that's how things start off, because I, that's what I've studied. You know, I'm completely unafraid of four guys on a Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember reading about the communists. You know, they, I think they met in 1905 in the London pub and there were 43 of them and they split. <laughs> <laughs> they split that weekend. And, you know, one of them was Lenin, you know, and like 10 years later, they're running Russia. 
you know, I don't, I don't give a shit about the communists. You know what I mean? I'm just looking at the social dynamics. Yeah. That you know, in the same with art, isn't it? You know, you've got some guy who's got a vision, and and ten years later, that is the main thing. Yeah. And you know, that's that's the joy of life for me. It's the complete ability for small groups of people to have massive effects because they're just doing something cool and with integrity. And we all know on this call. We've got that, you know, let's not be falsely hum humble about it. We know what's coming and most people don't want to look at it. So whatever we're saying and the people we influence are going to be the next major thing, you know, assuming we don't have fascism. You see what I mean? We are it. And that's that sense of, you know, just the little hairs on your back sticking up, you know, or is it on the back of your neck? You know that phrase? You know, that when I talk to audiences and I say, this is it, you can tell that they suddenly got this enchantment about their lives again. That they're going to, you, you see what I'm trying to say? They think, oh, right, they're part of history. They're part of the human story. They're not looking in on this terminal crisis and just being miserable in their bed sets. They're going, oh, no, no, let's, let's you know, let's do it. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I'll be, I'll be emailing you all. <laughs> well, that's a problem um, do a do a zoom roger has got a plan straight away <laughs> no i like I'm it happy to sign like, up for it roger i really will i was going to say we're engaged in uh, evolution and the r is silent there you go <laughs> yeah there yeah you go. um we have really gone well into a second hour here mm. and i i'm inclined to say do we i wanted i would love to do this again the four of us again I won't put it on a calendar yet. I'll just stay in touch with you and we'll see about maybe we can do this again someday in the not too distant future. But two things came to mind. One, uh, I found that drawing, so uh, that fish drawing. So I want to let share that just in case it's not fresh in everyone's memory. So bear with me. Remind me to unshare. <laughs> <laughs> right. There it is. Yeah. I said yeah. I just Fish was running this thing where he said to his patrons on Patreon, he said, if you want to send me a single word, I'll whip out a sketch for it and send it back to you. So I sent him Soul Nostalgia. I think it was the first one I sent you. I think so. Yeah. Well, there well, you go. <laughs> it's it's one of my favorites of your drawings, of course. Um, all right, two seconds. There. <laughs> um philosophically we've touched on all of the key topics we've touched on aesthetics deeply we've touched on ethics deeply we've touched on politics or political philosophy philosophy of language i mean the, the whole much of the philosophical spectrum has come up in the conversation so thank you because that's exactly what i wanted to have happen mm -hmm. um the other dimension to my favorite philosophers are the stoics in particular, one of the lesser known Stoics for whom a butterfly is named, Chrysippus, because I'm kind of an obsessive logician. And Chrysippus was the logician for the Stoics. And in my imagination, there was a time when the Stoics with Chrysippus as their spokesperson and the Aristotelians with Aristotle as their spokesperson, they had an argument over whose logic was going to dominate. Well, the common perception of Chrysippus' logic was, if the gods use any logic at all, it's Chrysippus. But the Aristotelians won out. And 2,000 years later, we finally figured out that was an inadequate logic for science. <laughs> Took 2,000 years and Russell and Whitehead had to prove just how inadequate it was. Anyway, that's the uh, almost last philosophical comment I'll make, and this is the last one. A common theme that I'm picking up here among the four of us uh, was a two-word phrase, that come, Latin phrase, that comes right out of uh, the Stoics. Amor fati, love your fate. And if we can do that, we might just have a chance for a symbiocene future. So anyway, gentlemen, I can't thank you enough. You've been brilliant, you've been inspiring, you've been 
engaging and enticing. And I just thank you for spending the time with me and with each other. So thank you for spending time, Jerry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Right. Anytime. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my recording, Glenn. If you want to stop yours, we'll have a couple more minutes and then we'll yep. finish it up. All right. So uh,